An attitude of gratitude brings Governor Umahi to meet Buhari, but beyond the appreciation, request for Southeast Presidency in 2023 resonates. It was an endorsement of uh, total acceptance of Mr. President in Southeast, and uh, most uh, immensely, and with all gratitude to God and deep appreciation to Mr. President. An omission in new electoral arts takes National Assembly for another trip again. Such an unintended clause has to be amended before the party primary starts in the next eight days. Plus, twists and suspense. Great party chairman as INEC turns down their plea for extension of time in the conduct of primaries. I hereby reiterate the position of the commission that there will be no review of the timelines. Hello and welcome to NT8 Network News, reaching you live from Abuja. I'm Ian Ray John. Adela Komiakere joins me from Lagos. Many thanks for joining us. And just before we hit the road, it's good to know that you can follow this news broadcast live on our website, nt.nj slash live, and all our social media platforms displayed on the screen for updates. We'll begin from the State House, where Governor David Umahi of Ibo State has expressed formal appreciation to President Muhammadu Buhari for approving the federal government's takeover of King David University of Medical Sciences, Uburu, constructed by his administration. The governor was on a thank you visit to the Nigerian leader, who was on a two day visit to the southeastern state. State House correspondent Adam Musambo brings us details. During his recent state visit to Ebony II, since coming to power, President Muhammad Buhari inaugurated various legacy projects symbolizing the new phase of the significantly transformed salt of the nation. One of them is King David University of Medical Sciences, Uburu, which he accepted federal government's takeover on the request of the state government. Governor Dave Umahi is here to formally say thank you to the president on behalf of the people of Ebony and indeed the South East leaders. It was an endorsement of uh, total acceptance of Mr. President in South East and uh, most uh, immensely and with all gratitude to God and deep appreciation to Mr. President. Thank him for the takeover of that medical uh, university. The truth is that it's beyond what the state government can manage. And the truth is that it has become the center of excellence. And the, the signature of Mr. President is in that university. He built the isolation center and equipped it. He built the cancer center and equipped it. He is contributing immensely in the building of the liver transplant center, the kidney transplant center, and uh, the best eye center anywhere in Africa. And I continue to tell people to stand up and be honest and speak out about the kindness of this man and the, the projects he has completed. And so he has contributed immensely to what we are looking for, and that's to abort medical tourism. The governor described the reception accorded the president by the people as an endorsement of total acceptance of the Nigerian leader in the southeast. And the president, you know, has discharged himself creditably as a man of peace and a father to every section of this country. Mr. President is a man with good heart, he's a kind man. He has no joy you know, to incarcerate anybody. He has no joy for the pains of anybody. He's a man I've not seen that says, uh, you use the instrumentality of government to go after my perceived enemies. We do not support agitation to secede from the Nigerian nation. We want to belong to a Nigerian nation. On calls for the release of Nam Dikanu, he made it clear that although the matter is still in court, President Buhari is not averse to political solution, hence the urgent need for Hanez Ndibo to take appropriate action. Governor Umai, who is also an APC presidential aspirant, once again made a strong case for the presidency to be zoned to the southeast in particular for justice, equity and fairness. From the State House, Adam Sambu, NTA News. Heading to the National Assembly now, the Senate has passed the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2022, which seeks to correct the omission of statutory delegates in Section 84 by deleting the existing subsection 8 and inserting a new subsection 8 after subsection 7. 
National Assembly correspondent Ignatius Okuo reports that the Senate, before the third reading, suspended its rules and considered the bill for both first and second reading at Tuesday's plenary. On the 25th of February 2022, President Muhammadu Buhari signed the amended Electoral Act 2022. Less than three months after the presidential ascent, the legislators have discovered an omission in the new law. Apart from elected delegates, there are others too who participate in political parties' convention who are qualified by their positions, such as elected local government councillors, chairmen, members of state assemblies, state governors and deputies, members of the National Assembly, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Vice President and the National Working Committee of Political Parties. But the new electoral law did not make provision for these delegates. That is what this amendment bill, sponsored by Deputy President of the Senate, Ovie Omoa Gege, seeks to correct. Mr. President has couched Section 84, Subsection 8 of the Electoral Act 2022 does not provide for the participation of what is generally known as statutory delegates in the conventions, congresses, or meetings of political parties. Mr. President, this is an unintended error. Ensure that what the political parties are known to do by allowing statutory delegates in addition to the delegates that will be elected by the various political parties constitute the electoral college. We still have a lot of you know, sections in the electoral act that we need to look into. President of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan, explains the urgency of the amendment. Such an unintended clause has to be amended before the party primary starts in the next eight days. And therefore, this is an emergency legislation, so to speak. Senate observed a minute silence in honor of late former Senator Francis Aton Zeribe, who died on Sunday, the 8th of May, 2022, from the National Assembly, Ignatius Nkwo, NTA News. And still on electoral matters, as the June 3rd deadline for the submission of party candidates approaches, the Inter-Party Advisory Council, IPAC, is appealing to INEC for two months' extension for the conduct of party primaries. Chairman of IPAC, Yabagi Sani, made the appeal at a consultative meeting with INEC in Abuja. INEC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, however, says the hands of the Commission are tied by the new electoral act so June 3rd for the submission of candidates remains sacrosanct. Mie Ogidi reports. Seven out of the 18 party chairmen are attending this meeting for the first time, including APC, PDP and NNPP. So the answers and the smiles I expected. The smiles were on until an appeal came that has changed the mood of the meeting. The IPAC leadership is appealing to the INEC to extend the deadline for the conduct of party primaries and the resolution of ensuing conflict from the present INEC given date of 3rd June 2022 to 9th of July 2022. I hereby reiterate the position of the Commission that there will be no review of the timelines. There are so many interrelated activities that are associated with the timelines which must be carried out. Any review to extend the timelines for one activity will affect other activities and put unnecessary pressure on the political parties and the commission. It is a consultative meeting to finalize the contents of guidelines prepared by INEC to ensure smooth party primaries. Because in 2019, INEC was party to 807 pre-election cases. A situation the Commission appeals should not repeat itself in the 2023 elections. Mie Ogidi, NTNews. And away from electoral matters, for Africa to fully invest in developing human capital, the continent's burden of debt needs to be lifted off her shoulders. This was the focus of discussions earlier today at the Conference of Speakers and Heads of Parliament holding in Abuja. National Assembly correspondent Damiali reports. 
A World Bank report released in October 2021 places that in sub-Saharan Africa at a record $702 billion, the region's highest in a decade. Servicing these debts limits the channeling of resources to build capacity and develop infrastructure, which is one of the factors that inhibits growth and development. We have confronted the unfortunate reality that Africa's debt burden, both the fact of the debt and the conditions of servicing represent a significant inhibitor to progress and full prosperity on the continent. The impact of COVID-19 and the recent invasion of Ukraine are pushing the continent further down the line. Unconstitutional change of government is becoming more and more uh, apparent, specifically in the West African region. This crisis are the layering upon economic shocks and knockoffs of after the effect of COVID-19. So COVID-19 is making our ability to resist poverty, our ability to, to be more resilient, uh, that much more difficult. And many, many young people are now being forced in many ways to see that maybe our democratic systems are not working as they should. Because the COVID-19 has made us to discover that we lack we, we were almost lost. Let's embrace what other can, African countries are doing and let's learn from them. Let's go to Rwanda. Women constitute the majority in our society. We cannot afford any development while leaving out the majority of the stakeholders. The topics addressed as the conference centered on democracy in Africa, food security, financial reforms, effective budgeting and strengthening capacity of parliaments for effective oversight. A communique will be issued at the end of the conference. Lami Ali, NTA News. Elsewhere, state governments have been urged to develop initiatives within the National Road Safety Strategy 2 to address challenges of effective road management in the country. Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, emphasized this at the opening of the FRSC Capacity Building Workshop on the implementation of the Nigeria Road Safety Strategy 2, Phase 3. OAME Ajay reports. Following the approval of the Nigeria Road Safety Strategy 2 by the Federal Executive Council in December 2020, the FRSC has continued to pursue reduction of road crashes relentlessly. The Corps has also prioritized full implementation of the strategy within the stipulated time frame, which is between 2021 to 2030. This third phase of the strategy is targeted at states as the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, represented by the Permanent Secretary Ecological Office, reiterated that 70% of trips are made by public transportation, which has made human and vehicular movement more intense in and around the cities. We are poised towards developing homegrown strategies for road safety crash and fatality reduction to contain the nation's vast road network of 204,000 kilometers and high level of vehicle activities in the country. The NRSS2 is considered a pathway in sustaining road safety intervention in our country through implementation of planning, coordination, execution, uh, design regulation, awareness creation, research and training. Also, the Corps, in collaboration with the Center for Management Development, has commenced a 10-day management training for senior management of the Corps for better capacity development. This workshop targets at equipping you with skills aimed at tailoring training to effectively meet the needs of your clients. The workshop is also designed to provide knowledge and skills for effective service delivery of the call. In Abuja, Oyeyemi Ajayi, NTA News. Meanwhile, sustaining and improving on the security at the Gulf of Guinea has been reviewed using inter-regional coordination. Ikechuku Undukwe reports that the engagement is at the instance of Nigeria. The Gulf of Guinea is a vast region covering approximately 6,000 of coastline important in transporting oil and gas to and from Central and Southern Africa. In 2021, 
Nigeria deployed the Deep Blue project to cater for land, sea, and air security within the Gulf of Guinea, which the coder say has brought sea piracy and robbery to the barest minimum. Uh, there has been quite a number of operations that have been launched. The Nigerian Navy on 1st of April launched Operation Dakota the Farao, and we have been able to more or less bring to a halt all activities of illegal refinery, uh, refining in the Niger Delta. We have 16 armored vehicles. Now, presently, not all the assets are deployed. Why? Because some were about to collect it from the Nigerian custom that is declared from the Nigerian custom. Uh, I'm here to lend voice uh, to this notable initiative that the GOD, GOG Shade Initiative has undertaken over the last couple of years. And you can see from the statistics of IMB that piracy, which had hitherto sent insurance rates of ships coming to this region at wartime rates, uh, Nigeria in, has indeed been dropped from uh, the leading country of piracy attacks in the Gulf of Guinea. This stakeholders' engagement, the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA, says we leverage on inter-regional coordination to sustain and improve security in Gulf of Guinea. Drawn from countries in Africa and the European Union, these top military personnel, especially the Navy, in coming days, we come up with more security roadmap to sustain and improve security at the Gulf of Guinea. In other news, the presidency has categorically stated that the May 29 handover date remains sacrosanct and that President Maud Buhari will step down after serving two terms as provided for in the Constitution. This was contained in a statement from the presidency responding to Chief Robert Clark, a very well-respected elder who expressed a wish for the president to extend his term by six months. The presidency says, having been the first recipient of a democratic transfer of power from an incumbent administration to an opposition candidate in Nigerian history, the president is committed to extending and entrenching democratic values across the country. He shall, in turn, hand the privilege of serving the people of Nigeria to whomever they choose through free, fair and credible elections. While acknowledging Chief Clark's right to say that without security, Nigeria would not likely realize its true potential as a peaceful and prosperous nation, the administration says that is why it made sure core, such core of its policies. It says new challenges are tackled through the National Livestock Transformation Plan to alleviate herd of farmer clashes, the elimination of the leadership of ISWAP, and new efforts to combat banditry. The administration, till its last day, the statement says, shall take the security of the citizens paramount of paramount concern and shall respect the constitution and Nigerians' democratic rights as the best path to securing and then maintaining peace. While also noting the opinion of the likes of Chief Afe Babalola, who believe elections should be suspended with the current elected government replaced by an interim unelected administration, the presidency says such is contrary to the constitution and democratic rights could be path leading to crisis and instability. This administration, therefore, it says, proposes something entirely simpler, which is honoring the constitution and people's right. To decide. Time for a first break. Please stay. Thank you for staying. Three weeks after it was brought down by vandals, the federal government has reconstructed the transmission tower in Akwaibum State to supply power to the South South region. Joshua Odito reports that the ministerial delegation on inspection of the reconstruction work says the line will be energized. In the next one week. More than 400 megawatts of electricity lost from the national grid as a result of the vandalism, disrupting power supply in Cross River State and other franchise areas. Federal government says power supply must be restored 
and the agency in charge, the transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, on its tools in the last three weeks to fix the damaged infrastructure. Transmission tower mounted and work to energize the line in progress, expected to be delivered in one week. On the mandate of the power minister, the executive director of transmission service provider of TCN, Victor Adewumi, assesses progress of work. The tower is back. We are doing everything to make sure that this tower is completed and supply gets back to the public. So we are appealing once again to the general public that all the critical infrastructures that passes through their area, they should take ownership. Carefulness must be exercised. Because if in the course of drawing this conductor, it slips, it goes straight to the swamp. And if the tension is very high, it can drag it towards the river. And that becomes the most dangerous one. While federal government is engaging communities to take ownership of critical infrastructure against vandals, there are plans to deploy technology in safeguarding power infrastructure nationwide. Joshua Ojito. TA News. And still in power, federal and state governments are embarking on a coordinated approach to implement off-grid electrification projects for rural communities. Again, Joshua Audita reports that the Rural Electrification Agency is driving the initiative to ensure every community has access to electricity to boost rural economy. From the 36 states of the Federation and the FCT, Policy makers and industry players in the power sector are here to share experiences, challenges and interventions to bridge the energy gap in rural communities. The areas has collaborated with us. We have one mini grid which was uh, commissioned about two years ago. By the end of this program, we will um, understand, uh, especially the legal framework, for us to generate power for our people. Every community deserves to have electricity. With the target to power in Nigeria with one community at a time, Rural Electrification Agency is facilitating the conversation on how best to implement rural electrification projects. While federal government seeks more private sector participation to deploy off-grid solutions in rural communities, there are challenges hindering implementation of rural electrification projects in the hinterlands, which this forum is expected to address. So much effort has been put into it already. I can tell you that of all the six geopolitical states, we have had two projects in every two communities in any of the geopolitical, every of the geopolitical zones. And we're spreading it more and more. After this retreat, you'll see more of the work. It's very important for it to have productive use for our rural communities. So I think these are the things that we are really working on currently uh, to ensure that our programs become more coordinated uh, and more effective uh, at the state level and uh, dom uh, domesticated from state to the local governments as well. Nigeria Governors Forum and Development Partners are supporting the initiative to ensure that every community is energized. Joshua Ojito, NTA News. In other news, the Shehu of Borno, Abubakar Ibn Umar Garbai Alamein El Kanemi has appealed to the federal government to connect returnee communities to the national power grid as they now pick up the pieces of their lives following challenges of the insurgency. The royal father was speaking when he received the Director General, National Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, Professor Ayo Omotayo, who led participants of Senior Executive Course 44 2022 on a visit to his palace as part of their study tour of Borno State. Mohammed Ibrahim reports. The National Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, NIPS, in Kuru Plateau State, Nigeria, is a policy formulation center for bureaucrats, private sector leaders, army officers, and medium rank and senior civil servants, which was founded in 1979. 
led by the Director General, these 17 participants of study group 7 are on a mission to experience and analyze the local governance system and its sustainability in providing the needs of the citizenry, which brought them to the Shiro of Borno's Palace. We chose Borno State as one of the states because we find it to be very important and critical in the scheme of things in Nigeria. Chair of Borno, in his response, appreciated the federal government for considerable achievements of security at the grassroots and return of most displaced communities and solicited reconnection of Ngala and Abadam local government areas with the national grid and construction of road network, respectively. So honestly, we're in a very terrible situation. But now, alhamdulillah, the security situation and security people are on top of the situation. The delegation also had an interactive session with management of Meduguri Metropolitan Council, where the team lead, Brigadier General Wawo Nasser, disclosed that the presidency directed the study challenges and available options in a bid to strengthen local governance and transparency. The chairman of Meduguri Metropolitan Council, Ali Umara Bolo, recited challenges of empowerment of local population, as well as community-driven achievements in the areas of provision of basic needs with the support of federal, state, as well as NGOs in the 15 wards of the council. In Meduguri, Muhammad Ibrahim, NTA News. Now heading to the southeast, the sit-at-home order imposed by the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra has continued with consequences on all sectors of the economy. Timaruki Ugu reports that candidates of the 2022-2023 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination were equally affected. Like other states in the southeast region, the streets of Enugu are like ghost towns on Mondays. Little did candidates who applied to take the Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination, UTME, on Monday the 9th of May 2022 know it was going to be impossible to write an exam well prepared for. Fear of the unknown kept them indoors as a result of recent experiences. It's so bad and uh, I'm not so happy about that. Don't even see the transfer because the ones you see, they will tell you sit at home. Unless you can pay them in a double way and we pay them in a double way to come. Because of the sit at home yesterday, I have to trek from Transeku to we are writing the exam. And after every year, we still not write the exam. In that morning, the sit at home is here affecting us here. Some students have, however, appealed to joint admission and matriculation board to consider and reschedule the examination for the affected candidates in the region. In Enugu, Chimaroke Ugu, NTA News. Meanwhile, the Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, JAMB, says it will not release the 2022 UTME results until all reports of examination malpractices are submitted. JAMB's Registrar, Professor Ishak Oluyode, said this while fielding questions from correspondent Olain Kaujo. As the 2022 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination progresses into the fourth day, JAMB says... 70% of the results are ready. The Registrar of JAMB noted that the board has no reason not to release results, but not until the board concludes an internal appraisal process. If one, we don't want this situation that you release results and you start to withdraw some. So we have asked people to submit reports particularly of my practices. Mm -hmm. And any when we now, for the first day, after the result was ready and we now scrutinized, and we saw that about 40% of the results were not, of uh, the reports were not in. So why releasing 60% and creating confusion? For candidates who are unable to sit for the examination as a result of technical hitches linked to one of the telecommunication companies, the registrar assured that they have been reassigned. We have a technical issue from one of our uh, service providers and they, where they were supposed to use one character, they use another and it created some problems for the candidates. But we have addressed that by reassigning them and all of them without exception at the end of tomorrow we are putting them fourth session. You know, third session finishes at around 3.30. So we deliberately created a fourth session to clear such people, and we'll clear them by tomorrow. 
At the end of today's UTME exercise, more than 1.6 million candidates have sat for the examination. Online Kaujo, NTA News. Let's now talk politics. As the race for political parties' presidential ticket continues, Vice President Emir Shibajo has met with delegates of the All Progressives Congress in Bochi. Mahmoud Mohammed reports. <laughs> Supporters welcoming Vice President Yemi Usimbanjo to Bochi. The visit was short but impactful. He is in the state to meet delegates of his party, the APC. But first, he must pay homage to the Emir of Bochi, His Royal Highness Rulwan Suleiman Adamu, and inform the monarch of his intentions. The Emir of Bochi in turn blessed the Vice President and his entourage. Then the main business of the day. Although held behind closed doors, he meets with the delegates of the APC in Bochi State with the aim of convincing them on why he is the right man for Nigeria's presidency. He said, I also want to get a sense for what they want and what they like to see in the government and in the coming government, what they like to see. So the interaction is usually quite an intensive where we have a back and forth and questions are asked. And I think it's been very fulfilling, very satisfying. During his visit, Vice President Yemi Osimbanjo was at the tomb of late Saouba Katafa Balewa and the residents of Bochi based Islamic scholar Sheikh Tahir Usman Bochi. In Bochi, Mahmoud Muhammad, NTA News. From Bochi to Gombe, Vice President Yemi Osimbanjo was in the state to seek support of delegates ahead of the party primaries. Emmanuel Akila brings us details. On arrival to Gombe, Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo, who was received by Governor Muhammad Inouye Yahya, headed for the palace of the Emir of Gombe, Abubakar Sheikh Abubakar III. He informed him of his intention to run for the office of the President of Nigeria come 2023. On April 11, 2022, I formally declared my intention to run as President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria after serving uh, as vice president to our president, President Muhammad Buhari, for the past seven years. And we pray that by God's grace, I will do so for another year on to, up until May 29th, 2023. Your Royal Highness, in that period of seven years, I had the uh, honor of serving under a transparent leader, uh, President Muhammad Buhari. Governor Muhammad Inouye and the Emir of Gombe welcomed him and wished him well in his endeavor. We are peaceful, we are loving, we are loving because you've shown us love. We are caring because you showed us care, and we are patriotic. We want this country to progress and progress. Your visit today highlights the strength of friendship that exists between your good office and Gombe Emirate. As a vice president, you have been part of the success of, of the present Muhammad Buhari administration in your role as chairman of the National Economic Council. Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo had a close door consultative meeting with the delegates, then continues on his mission to other states in Gombe. Emmanuel Akila, NT News. And still in politics, as Nigerians strategize to get credible people into elective offices in the coming general elections, people from Gombe North Senatorial District have continued to mount pressure on a businessman and philanthropist, Bala Belu Tinka, to contest for senatorial position. Talato Lamon reports on the extent to which they have gone in trying to actualize their dreams. <laughs> 
the All Progressive Congress Party supporters, businessmen, friends and associates converge on the residence of one of their own, a business tycoon, Balabe Lotinka, taking him on a west by presenting him with a nomination form they purchased to join the race for Gombe North senatorial seats. The unions including National Union of Road Transport Workers, Granite Millers Association, Okada Riders, Blacksmiths Association, Patient Medicine Association, among other unions, explained that their decision is in view of his track records, commitments, dedication, and selfless service to humanity. People have spoken, and I believe they will speak during the primaries and general election. Overwhelmed by the show of love, Bello Tinka indicates willingness to answer their clarion call, but that was after asking them if that is all they want. <laughs> I'm really overwhelmed. You can see the enthusiasm, you can see the love, you can see how people are excited. I'm really overwhelmed by the support of people from Gombe North, a senatorial district. In Gombe, Talatu Lamon, NTN. Let's head to Lagos now, where Adeola will feed us with more news. Adeola, it's over to you. Thank you, Ayere. The federal government has assured that it will continue to support and create the enabling environment for robust investment in all sectors of the nation's development and growth, where citizens are guaranteed quality life. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed stated this when he undertook a media tour of Dutch's International Hospital, a private initiative that provides world-class one-stop hospital services to patients in Lagos. Anthony Forsen reports. Lai Mohammed, accompanied by journalists, was conducted around the five-story building housing the hospital. In the end, he spoke glowingly on the vision of the initiator and assured that the vision of the management to scale down outbound medical tourism in the country has indeed come to fruition. Patients are already coming in here from other countries and that saves a lot of money exchange for us. We are told that some Nigerians who have gone to, top, to world class top hospitals come back and they actually attest that the services available here are actually at par with those that received abroad. Attributing the initiative to the support and enabling investment environment created by the present administration, Lai Mohammed said the investment will go a long way in allowing Nigerians access qualitative and affordable healthcare needs. Overall, what it means is that it is better health care for Nigerians. Gentlemen, I'm proud to be a Nigerian. Once again, having seen uh, not just the level of technology, yeah, but the confidence of the promoters of this hospital in investing so much in Nigeria. And also, I see the excitement and the pride of the returnees in offering back to us what they used to give other people. The chief executive officer of the hospital, Dr. Adito Kumbo Shitabe, says the hospital is open to all Nigerians and affordable. What we are saying is precisely this. We want to ensure that right here at the Duchess International Hospital, we're able to reduce the cost of access to essential hospital services. That is the first thing, the first point that we are keen to make. The mission statement of the management is to redirect medical tourism funds back into the country. In Lagos, Antony Forsen, NTN News. The Minister of Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola, has assured Lagos residents of speedy completion of the rehabilitation of a Kwakmongbong bridge while appealing to the legal occupants under the bridges to vacate for safety. The Minister said this during the inspection of under bridges in Lagos. Ruthria Samuel reports. The visit by the minister was to ascertain the level of damage on the Akwangbom Bridge and the ongoing rehabilitation there. The minister, who was satisfied with the pace of work, assured Lagos residents of speedy completion of the project to reduce the stress residents and road users go through. 
The minister also inspected the Ojaoba, Obalende, and Eko under bridges. He enlightened illegal occupants there of the dangers of operating all kinds of business activities. Briefing the media after the inspection, the minister noted that of the 105 bridges in the state, 22 have been completed. He further stated that the federal government remains committed to ensuring all the bridges in the state are safe and much -able. What the problem is, you know what the solution is, we have a plan to do it. We now need your support, your understanding, and your tolerance to enable us to do this for everybody's sake. The Echo Bridge at Bombo Under Bridge has been shut down to enable repair work on the burnt section. In Lagos, Ruth Ariel Samuel, NTA News. Do not forget to follow this news broadcast live on our website at nta.ng slash all live and on all our other social media handles displayed on your screen for updates. The news will continue after this break with Yere in Abuja. Do stay on. Welcome back. The Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue is engaging the traditional rulers from Benue State on mediation and negotiation in peacemaking and conflict resolution, considering the security challenges the state is grappling with. Francis Form reports that also of concern to the centre is how to ensure rank of free 2023 general elections. Benue State, the food basket of the nation, has contributed a lot to the unity and growth of Nigeria. But recently, issue of security challenge, especially between farmers and herders, has brought untold pains. There is a change in strategy of the herders. In olden days, they will come with sticks, and if they destroyed any crops, they were very apologetic about it. For a farmer, if he has used a whole year to toil on his farm for his crops, and you come and destroy it, it means you have brought his life to serious crisis. To nip this in the board, the humanitarian dialogue considers the important role of traditional rulers as being central to peace-building process in the society, decided to put together a three-day capacity building for first-class and second-class traditional rulers in Benue State. The training which is facilitated by SFAR from Clinton Institute will focus on mediation and negotiation aimed at equipping the traditional rulers with knowledge and skills in conflict management and resolution. Somehow we have been able to arrest uh, some of the crises that would have blown out of proportion. And for the Director General of the Nigerian Television Authority, the NTA, Yaqub Ibn Mohammed, represented by the Director of Multichannels, Iohen Kwangi, any effort that will bring about peace in Benue and Nigeria is what NTA will continue to promote. The NTA is believing that with events like this holding, Nigeria is on the right path to ensuring that not only our political development is burden-free, but also other aspects of our lives are also being, going to be peaceful. This engagement, the traditional rulers believe, will be able to respond effectively in preventing, mitigating, and resolving local conflicts internally. Franks is from NTA News. Elsewhere, the Federal Inland Revenue Service says it is poised to engage in the expertise and experience of professionals whom have once been active in the act of tax receipts and now retired with a view to boosting the revenue base of the country. Executive Chairman FRS Muhammad Nami made the commitment while receiving members of the FRS Retired Officers Association. Benny Adams has the details. They are retired but not tired, and they are here to offer wisdom, expertise, and experience in the art of revenue generation through effective tax collection. Leader of the delegation, Samson Olukayode Taiwo says, beyond their advocacy for better welfare for its members, the association is open to offering technical skills for those still in service through training. We like the service to also look at it as a, as a support of knowledge. 
Bridging the knowledge gap of staff is central to the success being achieved by the service, says Mohamed Nami. We are currently working with the Kahaya Skill Department uh, to ensure that we come up with a criteria through which we are able to bring some of you back on board to be part of our technical sessions on a weekly basis. The FIRS in the year ended surpassed its revenue target of 6.405 trillion naira and is poised to doing more this year. In Abuja, Benny Adams, NTA News. And I also have Benny Adams with me here. He's ready to hit us with the latest in the business world. Benny. Thank you, Ian and welcome to Business. As part of efforts towards implementation of the Medium-Term Development Plan 2021-2025, the Ministry of Budget and National Planning is engaging relevant regional organizations for the purpose of tracking progress being made in advancing regional growth in the country. Minister in charge of the ministry, Clem Agba, while meeting stakeholders on the project, reiterated the need for urgent development at the sub-national levels. The plan envisages a rural development that is not just tied to agriculture. So, and the, the plan speaks to integrated rural development, where we begin to take all types of infrastructure to the rural areas. And on the capital markets, investors lost 52.35 billion naira as the All Share Index dipped by 0 0.19 to close at 51,805.41 basis point. Market capitalization stood at 27.9 trillion naira. The total volume traded declined by 1.79% to close at 337.5 six million valued at 5.55 billion naira and traded in 7684 deals g2 was the most valued traded stock by volume as well as value and also um 1.2 trillion then market recorded 33 gainers as 13 losers and 55 on change. Okomu Oil topped the list of gainers as Narco topped the list of losers. GTCO led the volume chart with 15.67% contribution and closely followed by Transcap and FBNH. Well, that is a business news. Network news continues after this break. Don't go away. <laughs> Build-up of activities to 2022 party primaries is the focus of NTA TUZ Live this week. TUZ Live, incisive and educative at 10.30 p.m. Join us. President Muhammad Buhari has commiserated with Dame Dr. Adora Umelji, the Deputy Managing Director of Zenith Bank and the entire family of Umelji of Aku Village, Anambra State, and the passing of their beloved mother and matriarch, Chief Lady Ungami Umelji. President Buhari eulogized her passion and commitment to humanity in advancing the good in others resonated in the church education field and the local community where she taught the lives of the less privileged and especially widows in the society. Mr. President prayed that God Almighty will grant her soul peaceful rest and equally grant all her children, grandchildren, numerous friends and relations the fortitude to bear the loss. And that concludes NTA Network News tonight. Many thanks for watching. Just a quick reminder that rape is a crime. Speak up and take action. I'm Yen Ray John. Do have a good night.